Hello everyone. In today's video, we're going to be taking a look at making a fun project, which is tic-tac-toe. And this is a great project because it's a very simple game, but there's a lot of complex stuff that you have to think about and understand in order to actually build a really good working tic-tac-toe project. So let's get started now. Welcome back to Web Dev Simplified. My name is Kyle, and my job is to simplify the web for you. So if that sounds interesting, make sure you subscribe to my channel for more videos just like this one. And to get started, on the right hand side over here, I have the finished version of our tic-tac-toe. As you can see, it's very simple. And when we hover over, we can select X's, and then it's going to go over to let us select O's, and then X's and O's, and X's and O's. And eventually when someone wins, it's going to say that they won and we have the option to restart and we can do it all over again. But if for some reason, no one actually wins. So if we get a board that ends up looking like this, it'll say draw and then it'll allow us to restart. This may look really simple, but there's actually a lot of complex logic that goes into it, which I'm going to be covering throughout this entire video. So make sure you don't miss any of it. To get started though, all we need to do is first create an HTML page. We'll call it index.html. And if we type exclamation point and hit enter, it's going to generate all of the boilerplate code for us, as you can see here. Next, we're gonna add in a link tag for CSS, and we're gonna use a style sheet called styles.css. This is where we're gonna put all of our styling so we can have all the hover effects. And then we're gonna create a script tag, which is just going to be here, script.js. And this is where we're gonna put all of the logic, and we're just gonna make sure we defer this so it loads after the body of our HTML, so that way we have access to everything inside the body. And now to actually open up this index file, if you install the extension called live server, you can just right click this and open it with live server. And it's gonna show up on the left-hand side here or on the right here, as you can see, and that's just a completely blank screen. And every time we make changes and save, you see that they're gonna be persisted over here. So what we need to do is first create our board for our tic-tac-toe. So we can just create a div with the class of board this is going to be where all of our tic-tac-toe elements are going to be inside of it. And we also want to be able to access this in the JavaScript. So we're going to give it an ID of board as well. This will just make it so we can easily access this in the JavaScript. And the reason I'm not using the class to access it in the JavaScript is so that I can separate my CSS and my JavaScript. I have an entire blog article on this, which I will link to down in the description if you want more information about that. Now, the next thing we need to do is we need to have nine different cells, one for each one of the places we can put a mark. So an easy way to do that with Emmet is we can say dot cell. This is going to give us one cell, but if we want nine, we can just say times nine. And now you can see that we have nine cells being generated. Also, I'm going to use data cell to denote these. Again, this is so we can easily access this information in the JavaScript without actually using the class cell since this is going to be for our CSS. And that's all we need to create our board all that's left to do is to create the page that shows up when someone actually wins. So if we just come here and have them win, we want to be able to create this page here. So an easy way to do that is we're going to create something. We're going to call it winning message. This is going to be that div that's going to have that black section around it. And inside of here, we're going to first want to have a div, which is going to have this text here. So we can just say div and we want this to have a data, whoops, winning message text, just like that. This is where our winning message text is going to go. So X is win, O is win, draw, whatever it is. And then also we need to have that button. So let's create a button. And inside of here, we just want to put the text restart. And we're going to give it an ID, which is just going to be restart button. And up here, we also want to give an ID to our winning message. This is just again, so we can access it easily in the JavaScript. And this right here is all of the HTML we need. If we refresh, you see we just have a single restart button. That's fine for now, because to actually make this look good like this, we're gonna need to do a bunch of styling in our CSS. So let's actually create that styles.css and start working on all of the CSS styles. Now, the first thing that I wanna do is set up some basic box sizing. So we can just say the everything selector, we want everything in the after, and we want everything that is going to be a before element. Essentially, this selects absolutely everything and we're going to set this to box sizing of border box. This will make styling our widths and heights so much easier. The next thing that I want to do is to work on actually styling the body 
This is again just going to be really easy. We just want to remove margins. And if we save that, you'll see this button over here moves up because we got rid of all of the margins on the page. That'll make this black background so much easier to put in place. The next thing to work on is the actual board. If you remember, this is the element that wraps all of our cells. And we want this to be here a width, for example, of 100 view width. And we want to give it a height, whoops, height of 100 view height. And what this is going to allow us to do is actually make it so that our board is going to fill the entire screen, which will make it so we can very easily center it inside of our screen. So to center it, we're going to use display grid to lay out our items inside this grid. And we're also going to justify content in the center and align content in the center. This is going to center our board element. So everything inside of the board is going to be centered inside of the board div. And we can see that by just selecting our cells, we're just going to give it a width for now of 100 pixels and a background color of black. And if we come over here and make sure that we give this a height as well of 100 pixels, you can see we have nine different cells in here and they're all perfectly centered inside of the screen, which is great. Now to make it so that we actually have our grid elements inside of this three by three grid instead of just in a line, what we can do is we can select grid template columns and we want to repeat three separate times. So we're going to have three separate columns, all just auto sized. So they're going to be the same size as the individual cell down here. And if we save, we now have that three by three grid. And if I just give this a little bit of a border, we'll say one pixel solid white, you can see that three by three grid showing up dead center inside of our screen, which is exactly what we want. Now to easily modify things with our width and height and make sure everything's super automatic, what we're going to do is come up here and select our root element and we're going to create some variables. The first variable we're going to create is going to be our cell width, which is going to be 100 pixels. We'll actually just change this to cell size since it's the same width and height. And then we can set our width to be that cell size. We can do the same thing to our height. And if we save, you see nothing has changed. And if you're not familiar with CSS variables, I have an entire video covering them, which I'll link in the cards and the description down below. Now, the next thing we need to do is as you can see here, our X's and O's are slightly smaller than the size of our container that we're putting it in, slightly smaller than the cell. So what we wanna do is we wanna create a mark size. This is going to be how large these X's and O's are gonna be. And we can actually just calculate that from our cell size. So we'll access our cell size, and then we're just gonna multiply this by 0.9. Essentially, we want this mark size to be 90% of the cell size. And we'll use this a little bit later when we create our X's and our O's. Now, the last thing we have left to do to ensure that our X's and O's are always centered inside their box, we can do justify items center, and we can do align items in the center. And this is going to align the actual individual things inside of our cells and not the actual cells themselves. And if you're confused about grid at all, I have an entire video covering CSS grid. I'll link that again in the cards in the description down below. So now that we have our board set up, we can actually work on finishing up what our cell is going to look like. Obviously, the background color is not going to be black, so we can remove that, but we are going to use a black border around these. And if we come over here, you can see we have our black border set up, and it looks pretty good other than the fact that we have all these extra borders around the outside that we want to get rid of. This is actually fairly straightforward to get rid of. We know that this is a three by three grid. So the first one here is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So what we want to do is we want to remove the grid from our first three elements here. So we can say cell first child. We want to again come in here and we want to get the cell of the second child. So we can use nth child two, and we can do the exact same thing, but for our third child, so nth child of three, and we want to remove the border top to be none. And if you save that, you can see we got rid of the border on the top of our page. The next thing we can do is we can select our cell of nth child. And instead of selecting individual childs, we can say 3n plus 1. And what this is going to do is it's going to go through all of our children, inserting n here. So for 1, it's going to be 3 times 1, which is 3, plus 1, which is 4. That's going to be the cell right here. For 0, it's going to be cell number 1. And for 2, it's going to be cell number 7. So it's these left three cells. What we can do is we can just set the border to the left to be none. And if we save, you can see we got rid of the left border on those left three cells. We can do essentially the exact same thing if we just copy this 
and we want to do instead of here 3n plus 1, we're going to do 3n plus 3. So that'll get the right side of our cells. So we can say border right is none. And there we go, we got rid of that right side. And the last thing left to do is the exact same thing we did here, but instead of the first child, we want the last child. So we can say last child. We want the eighth child and the seventh child. So these are going to be our bottom three, so we'll get rid of the bottom border. And there we go. Now we have our tic-tac board set up exactly the same as our tic-tac board over here. The next thing I want to work on is the individual X's and O's that go inside of our cells. And we're going to use a class of .x. So we'll have .cell, .x, and this is going to be where the styles for our X cell is going to go. So let's make sure our first cell here is just going to be an X cell. And for now, we can just change the background color to red. And as you can see, our first cell is going to be that X cell. So we can remove this background color and get started on adding in the X. And you may think the easy way to do this is just to add an X inside the cell like this, but then we have to worry about font sizes. And this X, depending on what font you use, is gonna look different on different browsers and with different fonts, and it's gonna be hard to center. It's just not gonna look very good. So instead, what I think we should do and what we are going to do is we're gonna use just plain CSS to create the X shape for us. It's actually fairly straightforward as long as we use pseudo elements. So we're gonna use the before and the after element. So we can get here, the before and the after element. And inside of here, all we need to do is set a content to something. In this case, it's going to be an empty string. That way these before and after elements render. And then we can come in here and create a width which we're just going to calculate the size of this width. For example, is going to be our mark size. And we're just going to multiply that by 0.15. We want it to be about 15% of the height of our X. So then our height is going to be that variable mark size. And just to see how this looks, let's set in a background color of black. And if we save, and you'll notice nothing is actually happening yet which means there's probably a problem with our mark size variable. So let's go take a look at how we define that. And you'll see that I missed a C in calc here. So now let's save that and you'll still notice nothing is happening. And the main reason for this is the fact that our cell is not actually displaying the contents inside of it very well. We wanna change this to be display flex, justify the content in the center and align the items, whoops, items to be in the center. And now if we save that, you can see that our bars are showing up and they're looking exactly like we want them to, but right now we're rendering an L and we want to render an X. Right now we have two different L's being shown, so we can just select one of these L's. We're going to say the before one, for example, and we can actually just rotate it by saying transform, rotate, and we're going to rotate this 45 degrees. And as you can see, that's one part of our X done. Now let's do the same thing for our after element, and we're going to rotate Take this the opposite direction, and you can see we have the other portion of our X done, but it looks not very good. Luckily, there's a really easy fix to make this work. Right now, the reason that they're showing up offset like this is because they're both displayed next to each other in the document flow because they're positioned static. What we need to do is position them absolutely. That way, they're going to have the exact same base, which is going to be the parent, and they won't overlap over top of each other. And all we need to do now is set it so that the cell is position of relative, just like this. And now, as you can see, we have a perfectly scaled X, which has the exact same amount of space between all of the different edges, exactly like we want. The next thing we want to work on is the O class, the circle class. So what we can do is just make this a class of circle, which is what we're going to use to create these O's right here. And again, you may think, let's just put in a big capital O, and that may work, but depending on your fonts and everything, it's not gonna be a perfect circle, it's not gonna look right, it's just not gonna be what you want. So instead, we're gonna create this entirely inside of CSS, and we're gonna do it very similar to how we did this X. So let's just copy down this X, we'll just save this portion right here. We wanna position it absolutely, we want a blank content, we want the width and height to both be the same, they're both gonna be this mark size, just like that. Make sure that we put the semicolon here. And now if we save that, you can see, whoops, if we change this to be circle, and this one to be circle, you can see that we have a giant rectangle or a square actually that's black right here, which is perfect for now. All we need to do is turn these into two separate circles. So the first thing that we can do is we can get the before element. So we can say dot circle before, 
and we want this to be the larger of our circles because we want it to be behind the other smaller circle. So we can copy over this width and height. We want the large width and height. We're going to make sure we set a border radius here of 50%. So it's going to be a circle, as you can see. And we're going to change the background color of only the before one to be black. Now, if we do the exact same thing, but for the after, whoops, after, and we change this to be slightly smaller. We're just going to say maybe times 0.7, so it's going to be slightly smaller. So now we have a width and a height that are both 0.7 of the original width and height of the larger circle. And if we change the background color to white, you can see now we have a perfect looking circle inside of our box here whenever we put the circle class. Now this is working great and everything is showing up perfectly, but there's a few extra things we can do to make this work even better. As you can see in this example, when we hover over a row, we get that nice little pointer icon, but we also get the symbol that whoever's turn it is. So for example, it's X's turn, so we get an X. Also, if we hover over a place that already has an indicator, we get this nice not allowed symbol showing up saying that we cannot click on this. So the first thing we can do is for all of our cells, what we wanna do is we wanna add a cursor, whoops, a cursor, and we want this to be the pointer cursor. And now you can see we get a pointer cursor for every cell we highlight over. But if we highlight over one of these cells that already has something inside of it, so if we highlight over a cell that is either an X cell or a cell that has the circle class, so essentially it already has an element inside of it, we want to change the cursor here to be not allowed. Now, as you can see, we get that nice little not allowed cursor over these ones and the pointer cursor over all of these ones. Now let's work on actual hover effect and this is going to be by far the most complex part of the CSS. So in order to determine whose turn it is, we're gonna apply a class to the board, either circle in the case of the circle, or we're gonna use X in the case of X. So let's just start with X, just like we did before. So now every time I hover over one of these elements, it should show me the X hover. So it should show me this X that you see right here. And in order to do this, we need to add hover effects to our cells. So the first thing we wanna do is select our board when it has the X class applied to it. And we wanna get the cells inside of that board. And whenever we hover them, we want to do something to them. And what we wanna do in here is actually the exact same thing that we're doing down here. We're just gonna be changing the background color. So what we can do is we can just copy this over and add it down to here. So we wanna get the before. And then we also wanna do the exact same thing, but for the after element. So now whenever we hover over a cell, when it's X's turn, we're going to apply this class to it. We also want to do the exact same things down here with this before. So we wanna make sure that we're only selecting the before. So here, now when we hover, we're doing the exact same thing. And let's copy over the after and do it down here. And if we go over here, you can see now when we hover, we get this X and it's going to do that on all of them. As you can see, it's even doing it when we hover over here or over this one. But what we wanna do is actually just make it so that it's only gonna work when we hover over an empty cell, essentially a cell that doesn't have an X or O in it. And this is where we can use the not selector. So we can say colon not dot X. So this is saying it doesn't have an X and we wanna do colon not dot circle. So what this is saying is only apply this hover effect when you're not already on a dot X or a dot circle cell. And we want to do this for all of our cells. So let's just copy this down to all of them. And now when we hover over one of these X's or O's, you can see it's not overwriting what we've already done there. It's not doing this hover effect because it's checking this not condition right here. It's fairly complex, but if you think about it and analyze it a little bit, hopefully it'll make sense for you. Now, the last thing we need to do is obviously change this background color. So let's just come up here. We have our hover. We want to make sure we copy this just like this. So when we're hovering over a cell that's not an X and it's not a circle, what we wanna do is change the background color to be light gray, just like that. And we wanna do the exact same thing for after. Whoops. So we'll come up here and we're gonna say after. But of course, if we hover over here, you see that that's not actually working. And that's because we already have black being defined in here and it's overriding the light gray that's above it. So what we need to do is also just select our cell dot X. We wanna do our before, and we also wanna do it for our after. So we'll say dot cell dot X after. And what we wanna do is put the background color of black inside of there. 
and just make sure that this is defined above our other selector, just so it'll override properly. And now as you can see, we get a light gray X every time we hover over an open cell when we have this X class on our board. So now let's just do the exact same thing, but for circle. Now we should get a circle whenever we hover over any of these different rows. So this is gonna be a very similar tactic to what we did before. So we can just find our circle code, which is right down here. And what we wanna do is we wanna say, when we're on a board that has the circle class, we wanna get the cells inside of it that are not already an X and that are not already a circle. And we wanna check when we hover over them, we wanna style the before element. And we also want to style the after element to be exactly the same. And we want them to have this different positioning and such just like this. We also down here want to do the exact same thing. So we want to select the before to go with this before. And you can see that's working here and the exact same thing here, but we want to do this for the after. Now, if we hover, you see we're getting the black circle. So again, we need to remove this black out of this area and put it up here, just like we did this with the cell for the X. So we'll just say cell dot circle and we want to do the before and we want to change the background color here to be black and actually since this is exactly the same we can just put this up with this class over here and then what we can do down here is say when we have a board that has the circle class and a cell inside of it that is not an x and it's not a circle whenever we hover over it we want to select the before element and change the color to light gray. Now lastly, to get this to work, all we need to do is come down here, remove this background color of black, and if we save, you can see we now have light gray circles appearing whenever we hover over one of these cells, and if we change this back here to be X, we now get the X's, which is exactly what we want. Now finally, the very last thing we have left to style is going to be this button down here, this restart button, so it shows up dead center in the middle of the screen. Luckily, the styling for this is going to be so much easier. What we want to do is we want to select that winning message div that we created. And what we want to do is we want to make sure this is positioned always in the center of the screen. And we want it to always take up every space. So we're going to position it fixed. We're going to set the top to zero, the left to zero, the right to zero, and the bottom to zero. And if we come in here and we just add a small background color so we can actually see this, we're going to use RGBA and we want this to be black. So we'll say 000 and 90% transparent. And as you can see, we have a black overlay covering the entire screen. The next thing to do is to make it so that our button is centered inside this. So we'll just come in here, display of flex, justify content in the center, and we'll align items in the center. And as you can see, it is now centered our button for us, which is exactly what we want. Also, let's add a little bit of text in here. We'll say X wins just so we know what this text is going to look like when we get to that point of styling. And what we can do instead of here is we can change the color to white because as you can see, it's impossible to read this text. So now we have white text and we'll change the font size to be five REM. So we have really big font so we can easily see it, which is exactly what we want. The next thing to do is we wanna style our winning message button. This is the button inside of this winning message. And what we can do is set the font size to 3REM, so it's a lot easier to read. We can set the background color to be white. Whoops, white. We want a border around it, which we're just going to do one pixel solid black. We're going to use a little bit of padding, 0.25EM and 0.5EM. And then lastly, we'll make sure the cursor is pointer. So now as you can see that button, it doesn't look too much different, but it's a little bit different and it looks pretty good in my opinion. Lastly. We're going to select that winning message button again and we're going to give it a hover state so we want to come in here and just invert everything so we're going to change the background color to white the border color whoops border color is going to be white and our background color is actually going to be black and we're going to change our text color to be white whoops white now if we hover you can see it just inverts that button which is exactly what we want and to stack these vertically we can just change our flex direction to column. And as you can see, these are now stacked on top of each other and it looks really good. The last thing to do is just by default, make it display of none since we don't want this to show up by default. And then we can move our display flex 
into a separate class, which we're just going to call winning message dot show. And inside of here, we're going to do display flex. So now if we apply the show class to this, it's going to show up, but without that class, it's not going to show up. Okay, we are finally now done with all the styling. I know it's a lot, but we're going to get into the fun part, which is the logic to make this tic-tac-toe actually work. But before we do that, let's just clean up all of these different extra classes and text we added in here, since we don't want any of that showing up in the final version. And there we go. We now have our empty cell exactly like we want it. So now the first thing we need to do is just create that script.js file, which is going to be all of our JavaScript. And the very first thing we want to do is select all of these different cells. So what we can do is just say const cell elements is going to be equal to document, whoops, document.query selector all. And if you remember, these are just a selector of data cell, just like that. This is going to be all of our different cells. And we can loop through them by saying cell elements dot for each cell. What we want to do is add an event listener. So we'll say cell dot add event listener. Every time we click on the cell, we want to add this. And we're just going to call it handle click. And an important thing is we want to say once is true. So inside of an object, we're going to say once true, which essentially means only ever fire this event listener once. So once we click on the cell, it's not going to fire again. So if I create that function of handle click, which is going to take our event, and I just console.log clicked. And if I inspect this, drag over this inspection, and I click on one of these cells, you see it says clicked. But if I click the same cell again, it's not going to fire until I click a different cell. Essentially, it only does a click event once. And we only ever want to be able to add once to this element. So it makes sense we only want to fire this once and no more because we don't want to be able to overwrite something that's already been done. So inside of this function, we actually need to do quite a few things. The first thing that we need to do is we need to place the mark. The next thing we need to do is check for win. Then we need to check for a draw. And then lastly, if none of those happen, we need to switch turns. So the easiest thing to do first is to actually place the mark. But to do that, we need to know whose turn it is. So we're gonna create a variable and we're just going to say circle turn. And if this variable is true, then it's circle's turn. If it's false, it's x's turn. So we can easily determine which class we're using by checking whose turn it is. And let's actually create a few constant variables, which is going to be our x class. And we're going to create a const, which is our circle class. And the circle class is just, whoops, circle. And our x class is just x. This way we can easily use these strings throughout our application without having to duplicate them all over the place. So let's get our current class that we're going to be applying. And we first need to get our cell as well. So we'll say cell is going to be our target, which is whatever we clicked on. So whichever cell we clicked on is going to be here. And our current class is going to be if it's circles turn, then we want to return the circle class. Otherwise, we're going to return the X class. So now we have our class that we're going to be applying right here, and we can actually place the mark. And to do this, we're actually just going to do it inside of a function. We'll pass the current cell and the current class, and we'll do it inside of this function here, which we call place mark with a cell, and it's going to have the current class. Luckily, this function is super easy. We're just going to say cell.classList.add our current class, just like that. And now when we click on something, you can see it's adding an X and it's going to add an X every time because right now circle is always false and we're never actually switching turns. So this is all working perfectly fine. Placing marks is going well. We're going to skip checking for win and checking for draw for now because switching turns is the most important thing to focus on. So we're just going to create a function called swap turns and this function is super easy. So we'll just create this here, swap turns. And all this function is going to do is it's going to take circle turn and it's going to set it to the opposite of circle turn. Now we click, it's going to be X's turn, then circles, then X's, then circles, then X's, then circles, then X's, and so on, always swapping every single time. The next thing that we want to do is if I refresh this and I hover, you see we're not getting those hover states. So I want to apply those hover states. And we can do that by just calling a function called set board hover class. And inside of this function, we're going to determine which class we actually apply. So we'll just say set board hover class. And we want to make sure we do this 
after we swap turns so that we know which current player it is. So we want this hover class to be based on whose turn it currently is, not whose turn it used to be. So now instead of here, we first actually need to get our board. So we can just say our board is going to be document.getElementById. And if you remember, we had an ID of board. This is our board element. All we wanted to do is board.classList.remove. So we want to remove the X class and we want to make sure we remove the circle class. That way we have no classes on it. And then if it is circle's turn currently, then we want to add in the circle class. So we'll say add class, whoops, class list dot add. And we want to add in, whoops, circle class. And then otherwise we want to add in the X class. So we'll say board dot class list dot add X class, just like that. Now, after we click on our first one, you can see we now have the proper hover state based on which class we are currently using, which is exactly what we want. But you'll notice a problem that our first instance is not actually setting the board hover class. So let's just create a function, which is going to be called start game. And inside of this function, we want to set up all of our cell elements just like this. And we also want to set the board hover class inside of here and we're gonna set the circle turn to equal false, just to start. Now, as you can see, oops, if we make sure that we call this function, so we wanna make sure that we call start game at the beginning so that we're actually starting the game. And now, as you can see, we get that X hover, then the circle hover and X and so on, and it's working for the rest of our app. Now, the only thing left to do is to check for wins and for draws. And what we need to do is create an array for all of the winning combinations. And this winning combinations is going to be an array full of arrays. So if, for example, you had an element in array in spot one, two, and three, you would be a winner. If you had it in one, four, and seven, you would be a winner and so on. But since this is an array, it needs to be zero indexed. So this spot is zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So for example, if you had a spot in zero, one, or two, that would be considered a win. So if you had three elements right here, that's a win. Again, we can do three, four, five. That's the very next row. And then lastly, we can do six, seven, and eight, which is again going to be the row after that. Now we can work on the verticals. So we can come in here, we can have zero, three, six. That's going to be these vertical ones here. We can also come in, whoops, and do essentially the same thing, but we're gonna do one, four, and seven. And then we're also going to have two, five, and eight. Now all that's left is to do the diagonals. So one, four, and eight, or I'm sorry, zero, four, and eight. And we're also going to do the other diagonal, which is two, four, and six. These are all the possible winning combinations for a tic-tac-toe game. And then we can use this inside of a function here, which we're gonna check for win. So we can just say if check win, then we want to do stuff inside of here. And inside of this check win, we're actually gonna pass in the current class and now let's create that function, check win, and we're gonna pass it to the current class, just like that. And inside of here, what we wanna do is we wanna check all of the winning combinations to see if some of the winning combinations are met by the current combinations. So we'll say winning combinations.sum. Essentially, this is going to return true if any of the values inside of it are true. So we can say return winning combinations.sum, and this is going to loop over all of the different combinations. And for each one of the combinations, we want to check if all of the indexes, so essentially if all of the values in our cell elements have the same class. So what we can do is our combination dot every, because we want to make sure every element has the same class. We're going to get the index, and then we're going to be inside of here. So we're going to say what we want to return our cell elements of that index. So we're checking which cell. So for example, that zero, one, two combination is going to be these top three cells. It's going to check cell zero one and two. And we want to check the class list and we want to see if it contains the class or the current class. So essentially what this is saying is if the current class is in all three of these elements inside of the combination, then we are a winner. So if every single cell inside of the combination is correct for at least one of the winning combinations, then it's a win. And what we can do inside of here for now is just console.log winner. 
And if we inspect this page, you can see we have our console over here. So we do X, then O, X, then O. And when we click X, you can see that it's a winner because we have three X's in a row. We want to refresh this, inspect the page again. We can do X, O, X, O, and O. And you can see again, we have a winner. And this time it's the O's instead of the X's. But obviously we don't want to just stop it right there. We want to actually show up a message, say that the X's are O's one and go from there. In order to do that, we can just call a function called end game. And for now, we're going to pass in false. This is going to be whether or not it's a draw. And we can create that function called end game, and it's going to have that draw passed into it. So whether or not it's a draw, in this case, it's a win. So what we want to do is if it's a draw, we're going to do something. We're not going to define that yet. But if it's not a draw, we want to select our winning message text element, which we have not created yet. So let's come up here and say our winning message text element is document dot get whoops dot query selector I believe let me make sure oh it's actually yep right here data winning message that is the selector that we're going to use so we'll say data winning message text this is our winning message text element and what we want to do is we want to set the inner text inside of here to be equal to a string. And what we want to do is just check to see whose turn it is. So if it's circle's turn, we want to say that the O's win. So we'll say O's win. Whoops, we don't even need the win. We can just put O's. And then we can also do the same thing for X's. And then after that, we want to put the text wins. So what this is going to do is it's going to check if it's circle's turn, print out O's. If it's X's turn, print out X's. And then print out the text wins. And then we obviously want to make sure that we actually show this. So we're going to say winning message element dot class list dot add. And we're going to add in here the show class. And the way that this works is we need to select this winning message element. So we can say winning message element, and it has an ID of winning message. So now when someone wins the game, it's going to print out the text and it's going to show us that winning message element. So let's just have the X's win. And as you can see, it says X is win. Obviously restart doesn't work, but if we refresh and come in here and make it so that the O's win, you can see it says O's win. And again, refresh doesn't work yet. Now let's actually go on to figuring out what we do if there's a draw. So what we just want to say here is else if there is a draw, so we say is draw, then what we want to do is end the game, but pass true for the fact that it is a draw. And then Obviously, if it's neither of those, we want to make sure we swap the turn and set the board. We only want to swap turns if there's no winner yet. So inside of the draw, we can do a very similar thing, winning message dot inner text. And we can just set it equal to here, draw. And now you'll notice immediately there's an error. Obviously, we haven't defined is draw yet. So let's actually create that function is draw. And inside of this function, we need to do a very similar thing that we did with our winning combinations. But essentially, we just need to check to make sure every single cell has been filled. So we can say cell elements dot every. And what we want to do is we want to get every cell and we want to check if it has a class. So we can just say cell dot class list dot contains the X class or if it contains the circle class. So we'll say contains circle class. So if every single one of the cells has either an X or a circle class, then we want to return true because it is a draw. And one problem is that this cell elements does not actually have an every method, but to get around that, we can just destructure the cell elements into an array and it'll have the method. And if you're not familiar with destructuring, I have an entire video linked in the cards and description that you can check out after this. So now let's actually make sure this works. We click X, then O, X, then O, X, then O, put an X here, O here, X, and as you can see, we get that draw text showing up. But obviously we're sending it on the wrong element. We wanna set this on the text element so that it doesn't delete our button. So let's try that one more time. We'll put X, O, X, O, just like that. And now you can see it says draw and the restart button is right here. So the last bit of functionality we have is to actually implement the restart button. So let's select the restart button. So we can just say up here, const restart button, make sure I spell that correctly. 
is going to be equal to document.get element by ID of restart button. Just like that, let me make sure that's correct. Yep. And then what we can do is we can just select a click event listener. So we can say restart button dot add event listener. Every time we want to click on it, we just want to call our start game function. So now if we come in here and we click on everything, whoops, I made the X's win, that's fine. But if we restart again, you'll notice nothing's happening. And because our start game function is not reversing the state of everything that's happened. Right now we're setting everything up, but we also need to unset everything up. So the first thing that we can do in here is we can just change our winning message element and we want to make sure we remove that class. So we want to remove the show class. So now if I just make the X's win, click restart, you can see it actually removed that show class, but of course it hasn't removed any of this other information. So we need to remove that next. We can do that really easily when we loop through all of our cells, we can just select the class list and we just want to remove the X, X class. And we want to do the exact same thing, but for the circle class, just like that. And we also want to remove our event listener. So we'll say cell dot remove event listener on the click. And we want to remove the handle click function, just like that. Now if we set this up so that X is win. we click restart, it clears absolutely everything out and we can go right back into it. This time, let's say O is win, and everything is working exactly like we want it to. And that's all there is to creating an incredibly robust and fun tic-tac-toe game. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to check out my other videos linked over here, and subscribe to the channel for more videos just like this. Thank you very much for watching, and have a good day.